Welcome back to Olympic Foil, I'm James. This video is an in-depth breakdown of attack on preparation foil with special guest FIE referee Chris Lennon. He will discuss how to make this call and give his thoughts on 18 video examples from top level bouts. The examples from this are also linked in the description as their own video which is about one minute long for each of the two types. If you know a ref, fencer or coach who would be interested in this content or could benefit from it Please send it to them as there is a major lack of content on this topic available. Chris, take it away. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. So um, this is a bit of a um, this is a bit of a popular call to talk about in general, um, particularly the last year or two. I think um, but there's been a trend towards referees giving more attacking prep since 2016, which I'm sure a lot of people who follow fencing have noticed. Um, I think mo there's a lot where attack and prep can occur but I think in foil fencing when people are talking about it and there's any controversy about it I think it's nearly always attack and prep against the marching attack and um, so attack and prep against the march um, which you'll um, which people is what they'll mostly talk about um, so to um, to be talking about it to be talking about attack and prep I think there needs to be a few uh, bit of an understanding of some of some of the terms and some of the situations in terms of how how referees and how um, how fences and, um, understand it, so prepara preparation as a term, uh, it it exists in the rule book referring to a few different things. Um, a beat is a preparation, a search for the blade is a preparation, a few other actions. Um, but in simple refereeing terms, a preparation is not attacking. If you are in preparation, you are not attacking. You are you could be doing absolutely nothing. You could be doing something which is not an attack, and that that's simply it. Um, an attack in the rule book, we um, we have the definition of the rule book: the extension of the arm preceding the lunge. Um, and of course, that um, referees are very liberal with that interpretation. Um, when we're often when we're looking at um, at whether someone is actually attacking or whether they are still waiting for their final motion, particularly in the march. We're often looking for an acceleration of the feet or a commitment of the hands or both, which indicates that the fencer is looking to complete their action within the next tempo or two, um, depending on whether they're doing a direct lunge or a step lunge. And in the modern men's foil game, it's very, very common to see a fencer holding their hand back, advancing with very small steps, trying to avoid committing to their final act in order to be able to see what their opponent is doing. Um, and at the top of the men's fo foil game and the women's foil game, you'll often see fencers advance, advancing, trying to draw out their opponent to launch a counter-attack or launch an attack on preparation. And at that level, if they are attacked, they'll often do counter time or deal with it in some way. Um, and if not, they will try to finish before their opponent can launch an action. A uh, common mistake... I particularly see at lower levels, that's uh, upper national level, lower international, particularly the early stages of junior internationals. You will quite often see fencers who feel they can march down the piece holding their hand back. And when their opponent attacks them, they can simply finish afterwards, which is, is not quite correct. Um, and it's, it is quite unhelpful that at the, at the high senior levels, which most people are watching, the fencers are better than that and they don't make that mistake so commonly. So when you see attack on prep, it's off at the highest level. It's very difficult to execute and it's often, um, it's often due to a tiny mistake by the person doing the marching attack. Um, I'm hoping the videos will, um, will make that more clear. Um, I think I, I had one glance through these videos on my phone. So I can really watch these ones, but I think there are one or two examples from a few years ago. It's definitely, Referees now are, are giving a little more room for attack and prep. They're willing to call it and they're being a little more stringent on ma making sure that fencers are actually committing to their final action to be give, given the attack over the preparation. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping we can watch some of these videos and that'll make it a little clear. Okay, so we got Ikin Vigorozzo here. Perfect example. Um, so this, this is a perfect example of attack and preparation. Um, so I, this is my own method, um, but I recommend I recommend it 
I recommended it in one of the previous videos, and I still recommend it, of um, when you're trying to pass an action and you're looking for when the offences commit, it's worth um, it's worth placing your hand or just focusing on placing a hand over one of the fences or focusing entirely on one of the fences. So I'm going to suggest this here. Maybe John, maybe James can do something uh, something clever, like um, like putting putting a black screen over half half of this or something, so you can only Ooh. see one fencer. That's a good um, idea. I'll give it a try. Yeah, um, maybe maybe you can do that, so you can like cover up Bitkin first and Barroso second or something. Um, so if I am yeah, if we play this video and we focus only on Garozzo, um, I'm going to put it back here. Um, so we'll focus only on Garozzo. He's advancing. He's waiting, waiting, waiting. And there his, there's his final action. So Garozzo's doing a few steps forwards, and then he launches a lunge, finishing, finishing an Atkins cart line. Um, and we can see when um, when Garozzo begins that, begins that action, it, uh, it's about here, a little, little before this. Um, so we'll, we can do the same thing again now. Uh, we'll focus only on Itkin this time. Um, so we'll watch Itkin. He moves forward. He goes backwards. He goes backwards. He does a steps for, two steps forward lunge um, with quite um, his hand quite held back. But we can see when his attack begins. So in this action, we know Gorotso was in preparation for a few steps there. He wasn't attacking. He was stepping forward, waiting, and then he committed with a lunge. We know Itkin went backwards for a few steps and then he did a step two-step forward lunge to hit. So the question, just like whether you're separating in the middle or any other any other fencing action, is simply who attacks first. Referees aren't in the business of saying whether an attack is good enough or whether it's pretty enough or anything like that. The only question is who attacks first. Um, so the amount Nick extends his arm doesn't matter. The amount Grosso is holding his hand back doesn't matter. All that matters is who actually begins first. So watch the video again, again, and can ask who who actually begins their attack first. Um, to this point, neither of them are attacking; they're both doing nothing. Nick begins, Grosso begins, and so the referee quite rightly mm. calls attack and preparation for it again. Um, and hope, hope that's clear. That was a very nice example. Let's uh, let's see what other ones you have. I bring yeah, interesting that you say um, the extension of the arm is not really uh, 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 the key factor for attack and prep. I feel sometimes uh, that people feel that way. Yeah, I've um, you definitely you hear you hear people talking about um, the arm being held back being being preparation. Um, the extension. The extension of the arm is one of the um, is one of the factors of an attack because inevitably you have to extend your uh, extend your arm to hit your, oppo your opponent. Um, but it's not it's not required to fully extend. It just has to be extending, and the timing the timing of that is um, is not particularly vital when passing mm. these when passing this kind of actions, and especially at the highest level like the. Um, uh, if you if you were to try and advance with your arm fully extended, you get parried um, every day of the week. Um, and but, uh, as you pointed yeah. out in that example with Itkin and Garazzo, uh, Itkin, who is getting the attack and prep himself, his arm is not extended until uh, the end. Yeah, you're right. And in fact, usually when in these kind of actions, you'll often see the person going for attack and prep extend their arm quite early um, for a few reasons. They want to make their intention very clear to the referee. So it's very clear to the referee, this is when I'm beginning my attack. Um, and um, it's also they want to be hitting quite early generally. Um, also because the, um, the timing for attack and preparation is very similar to the timing for a counter attack with a close up. Um, the distance also very similar. You'll hit usually with a fairly extended arm and then try and close, close the line. Um, and so playing between those two ideas, you want to keep your opponent from knowing whether you are going for an attack and preparation or whether you're going for a counterattack and you're going to close out. So part oh, yes. and top um, will play uh, between those two. It might, may go without saying Sorry, most on. people, but um, when it comes to a closeout, if there's a closeout, you have no chance. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, um, obviously, there's nothing. There's nothing in the rule book that says directly that closing closing the line invalidates your attack. Um, and 
if you hit with a good extension and then close the line, the a reading of the rule book would probably say there's no reason why that should that shouldn't be your attack. But the reality the reality is um, most most fencers, most referees, and most coaches all agree with the fairly sensible convention that if you are trying to do a defensive action, a counterattack, you are not attacking um, by by definition, um, and that's that's pretty that's pretty universally happened. I think the um, the lines can get slightly bur- blurred depending on the timing of the arm movement. For example, if you are hitting with an extended arm and closing the line within the same motion then it's quite it's quite simple to say well that's a that's clearly a counter offensive action rather than offensive action you're trying to defend yourself in the same motion by closing the line as you hit whereas if you were to hit with a very clean lunge and then parry afterwards a full tempo later in two clear actions you might have more of a chance but i think oh, for yeah, any of your yeah. viewers who are wondering how do they get attacking evasion Body evasion, the same thing. If you're, um, I think the general rule of thumb for anybody going for attack on prep, if you're trying to not get hits, you're probably not attacking. I think is is a safe rule of thumb. Um, if you if you want to be given these actions, and I think most most fences, most referees, most coaches, all all are quite agreed on that because it's it's pretty sensible. But yeah, we've got Fukoni v. Clybrink here. Yeah, we have another example of this. I'll I'll play it again. I think. Might might be easier to show this one in slow motion if I'm able to. Do. Uh, I have to go back a little further to give myself time. Just to make it clear. Um, there's a pause in Clybrink's attack, but I think um, a lot of um, I see a lot of referees and a lot of fences get hung up on the idea of one person stops, therefore it's my turn in inverted commas. And of course, the priority doesn't work this way. It's not a it's not a game of turns. There's a um, there's a vague convention of a reasonable amount of time to gain your balance, um, which is more exaggerated in sabre um, and less less in foil. But, but in general, there there aren't there isn't any such thing as a turn um, for um, for your attack. So Clybrink here, the attacking fencer, he stops his footwork at one point, and that that does signify a good opportunity for Ficoni to begin the attack, but it's just an opportunity. It doesn't grant Fakoni any priority unless Fakoni attacks into that window when Clybrink is not advancing. Um, so somebody stopping doesn't give priority to their opponents. It's just a moment that you could move forward into. Mm, it gives them an opportunity. Yeah, exactly. Um, in this case, um, Fakoni begins begins his attack just after Clybrink stop. But as Clybrick's restarting after his stop, he still isn't looking to finish. And I think Fakoni catches a surprise going there. So uh, Clybrink begins, you can see Clybrink's done like oh, this. Yes, um, yeah, Clybrink's done this this feint um, to cease to Fakoni cease then chest. And then he kind of stops, he's not sure. He starts again and he's still looking. And then Fakoni begins and Clybrink finishes afterwards. And it comes down very much to this pretty universal, universal idea across all refereeing of who's who's initiating and who's reacting. I think in this action, it's um, it's pretty clear that Fakoni is initiating the action and Clybrink finishes as a reaction to him. It's a shame that uh, almost always when priority is explained to beginners, it's explain, explained as taking turns. Yeah, I mean... Because it's simple and easy. Yeah, I've um, like in my own coaching, I've, I have I've certainly am um, fallen into that trap. Um, it's I don't think actually, in my own opinion, maybe this is a controversial one. It's always bad. I think for working with um, for working with young kids and the beginners to the sport, I think it can it give a decent idea. Yeah, um, I think. If it depends on the philosophy of what kind of student a coach might want to produce, whether what way they want to teach. Um, and I'm sure they would want to emphasize proper technique and attacks um, from early on. But I think it can be it can be a useful um, simplification, um, at least um, at least initially. Um, and I'm not I'm not against. But I also think I think I see a lot of people when they're talking about actions and inevitably attacking prep seems to be one of them. Um, they have a tendency to overcomplicate priority almost in a way of like trying to gatekeep our sports and make it this inaccessible thing 
which I think is the opposite of what we want. I think most refereeing and most actions are relatively simple. It's who's who beg- who actually begins first and who's reacting to who. Um, and I think so. I think quite often when attack and prep does actually happen, it tends to be quite obvious. This one you've shown here with Canyon Clybrink is pretty tight. Um, it's an impressive call by the referee because um, the distance was quite close. But even that one, I think, is actually pretty clear when you're looking for it. Um, you watch them advancing and who actually begins the attack first. The Canyon begins and Clybrink reacts, finishing with his arm. Um, mm. So we've got Avalo against somebody. Avalo, the master of attack and prep. Indeed. Yeah, the um the the same thing again. I hope um I hope this is coming clear. I'll click click back on it one more time. Uh you've got uh Safin taking over the attack here. Avila begins and Safin reacts. Um something I I, I want to mention actually there is the um is the hand preparation. Um Safin Safin here is searching for um searching for Avila's blades and Avila attacks as he's doing this. Um, it's, I'll, I'll slow it down for, for anybody who may, maybe didn't, wasn't able to see the, uh, see the blade actions there, just to make that clearer. Oh, we've gone right back to the spot. Hold on. Uh, and remember, um, if you're having trouble with these, Chris's trick works very well. Just cover one, cover the other. Yeah, uh, to, yeah, focus on look, what each fencer is doing. Both. But of course, do remember that, uh, priority is about the context of, what each fencer is doing relative to the other ones. So the reason you cover the, cover one or the other up is to isolate when what their actions are, when they're beginning, what they're doing. Um, and then you put those back into the context compared to each other to find out what the um, what the phrase of the action might be. Um, so what I um, what I wanted to mention, I'll, I'll show in this video, was um, when um, wh- I quite often see, I see this action happen a lot. I see fences call for a lot, which is where one fencer will search for their opponent's blade and the other fencer will avoid avoid that search. Uh, maybe by uh, perhaps, say, in this situation, Safin would be advancing. Um, he would search for Avila's blade. Avila might move backwards and then begin an attack in response. Um, and... Yes, a, a search for the blade is quite clearly a preparation because if we apply back to our litmus test of what a preparation is, a preparation is not attacking. So if they are searching for your blade, they are not attacking you by definition. Um, however, that just like with an attack stop with the foot feet or anything else, that doesn't grant priority in of itself. It's, it's just a moment when the opponent is not attacking, which means you could be attacking. So, if an opponent searches for your blade, that gives that gives a moment when you could attack if you um, if you would choose to, but it doesn't it doesn't grant priority. So you have to actually attack into that moment. An action I see very commonly is um, especially at uh, lower international junior and national level junior and cadet um, is a fencer perhaps advancing will search for the blade. The opposing fencer will move backwards in order to avoid the search. The advancing fencer will then, you know, reprise their attack or begin the, begin their attack after the search. And the fencer who avoided the search will not, will attack. And what they're not recognizing is that they avoided the opponent's search and then the opponent began their attack and they have launched a counterattack into that. Because the opponent's touch doesn't give them the right any any priority in of itself. It gives the moment when they can attack into, um, and that can be it has that to can be, be that a, moment exactly yes. And that can be a tricky timing. Can um, into a search that happened uh, several seconds ago. Yes, exactly. Right. They search example. they search for your blade. You, you then made a cup of coffee. They attacked, and then you counterattacked. It doesn't work that way. You've got to attack into the into the search. And at the um, at the highest levels, those search can be very small. This is why your coach probably wants you to have small blade work. Whereas at lower levels, sometimes those search can be big, giving a, a wider opportunity. Uh, but this is a nice example from Avila. You, um, it's a pretty pretty tough timing to um, to find. Um, I'll put it back a little more. I think this will still be in slow motion, so it should be nice and clear for people. I would say generally for anyone as a referee who's looking for attack and prep. It's not always good to watch, to look 
in slow motion for tanker prep. If you're looking at a video replay, it's not you don't really be looking in slow motion simply because it changes things. And on video, everything looks like preparation. When you when you slow things down, people never look like they're attacking. But I'm slowing it here just for some explanation and so people can see the blade search by Saturn. But I'd encourage watching at full speed generally. But yeah, we see Safin moves forward here. He searches for Avila's blade. Avila begins and Safin responds with an extension of the arm. Um, I'll put it once more at full speed. I don't know how far I can jump. Um, there we go. Hey, and I think it should be clear, clear just by almost like driving a car using your peripherals, um, hopefully that Avila begins first and Safin begins second. And uh, when he says, when he, he goes into the search, that doesn't necessarily mean with his arm. Yes, yes, uh, with his arm, with, with his arm, with his feet. Begins. Yeah, the um, the attack. Um, people might get caught up on the arm there. Sorry? Uh, I said people might get caught up on the arm there, but uh, from Avila, because he didn't extend, in, uh, he, he, he started extending after Safin searched, but he started during Safin, well, well in the opportunity. Yeah, it feet. was it was it was a touch on the late side, but Safin definitely hadn't begun. If for, I think in that action, actually, if Safin, for example, um, finished his um, finished his search for the blade, and it's always hard to show a, show a fencing action and um, and imagine it being done differently. But um, for example, if Safin were to uh, if Safin were to search for the search for the blade and immediately begin his his attack, he probably would have been earlier than Avila. Um, Avila didn't quite go into the search there. So you see how Safin searched for the blade and then retracts his arm and waits for a moment. He does a little hop. If, for example, mm. Sa Safin searched for the blade here and immediately extended, he would have been earlier than Avila. But instead, he searches, he waits, Avila begins, and he reacts. But yes, yes, you're right. You don't want to get too caught up on the um, caught up on the hand there. This is an interesting one. Oh, good. Because, um, oh, wow. Yeah. It's so, just alone, and also I think it yeah. would be uh, closer than almost any other pair. Yeah. Here, so you've actually just reminded me of something. Uh, I, something I want to mention, which was I think oh, it was tell, we tell. were looking we were looking at video later on. Um, which was that from a from a fencer's point of view, I think it's generally better to try and score to pack on preps with a step lunge. In the first video, it can use as a step step lunge. It's quite um he has a nice wide distance showing very clearly that he goes first. The closer the distance and the, the shorter the action you're doing, so a single tempo lunge, it's more likely the referee may see the advancing fencer as completing their attack and there's less time for you to make it clear that you're beginning first. If you're doing a step lunge on preparation, there's more room to make it clear that you are beginning before the other fencer. Um, so from a refereeing point of view, of course, you can go a second break with a lunge. I think in terms of success, I think it tends to be more clear using a step lunge. Um, but yeah, um, we so have a video now. For all the fences out there. Yeah, um, we have video here of scoring with a lunge. Yeah, I think it, it should be it should be very clear that um, Lee is not even advancing at this point. He's literally standing. I'll <laughs> a little further. Uh, he's literally standing still, searching for the blade. So I don't think I don't think Lee can make any strong argument that he's doing a step lunge attack when he's standing still. And launches a and Lee reacting, searching off target. Yeah, standing still and searching multiple yeah. searches. You did well to find that video. That's quite a quite a hard situation to find because, like I said, top level fencers will rarely find themselves in that place. But of course, such a strong defensive fencer as Kisara, I imagine it's quite hard to attack him. He doesn't even look at the video. He's like, no, nah, dude, that's attacking prep. Yeah, very clear. Excellent. Yeah, and so we have Gorotz against Jeremy Snuff here. Very much the same thing. This one's actually relatively tight. Um, the, the jostling back and forth in terms of like the stop-start by both fences isn't actually yes. too relevant. 
You imagine this as being similar to a middle action where both fences ah, okay. are launching uh, launching off the line. In terms of all you're really looking for, both fences, I think, does Jeremy Snuff also do a step lunge? Yeah, he does, a very small small half step forward lunge. And across the step lunge, um, both fences... Um, both fences do form of advanced lunge. Um, so all that really matters is who actually begins first. So if you're looking at it this way, all you, you know that Jeremy Snow does his half forward lunge and Garazzo does his step forward lunge. All you're actually looking for is who begins first, which I think I'll just put a bit further back. Um, should be able to see his Garazzo. Uh, relatively close action. Pretty tough, that. Yeah. I think that's probably that's probably a clean example of what a lot of fences will be looking for doing a step lunge. I think the march that Palti is doing here is a very common one to see, um, particularly at the lower senior, lower senior upper ju upper junior international level. It's a, a relatively passive march, and it's great to see. Imboden does a step lunge very clearly before Palti, um, and I'd say that's um, that's also. As common an action as you'd see, Imboden launching his hand very early, making it very clear his attack on prep. Avila again. Yeah. Yeah, and Yavador even, um, Yavador even acknowledges this hit. Um, he knew he got caught. Um, I think that this one, this is very clear. Avila is one of the fences who does go for attack on prep more. Um, so I can see why you were looking at his videos for um, for hits. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you you cut me out. It's very clear action. Um, I will say also, obviously, the smaller the smaller the step, the um, the it allows you to squeeze in a step lunge. You can see how tight Avila's footwork is there. Just let just yeah, makes it very very clear. Um, trying attack and prep might um, be kind of feel the, the the pressure and be tempted to try and make big steps. Yeah, entirely. Uh, I think when you start, the, the secret you really start first. Yeah, and doesn't the matter how how. Uh, yeah, and of course you want to be. You do usually want to be early with your hands um, because you're advancing an opponent who, if you've done the action right and they found a very tight timing where they may not be aware they've been caught in preparation, there's a chance they're finishing. So when they're moving towards you, it can be quite difficult to bring your point to the target. So it's definitely worth start, starting with the um, starting with the hand early, but that's getting more towards the coaching side of these actions, which isn't quite <laughs> yeah. quite where we're looking. But if you're calling it, uh, don't don't discount don't discount something in the right time just because it's uh, it, it starts pretty small. Yeah, I think um, and yeah, I think um, I think generally for anyone referring these actions, like like all fencing actions. Um, part of the beauty beauty of fencing it is that we are doing a sport. We're not doing a martial art, so we don't have our rule book is not prescriptive. There's a um, there's an, a very important page on the first page which I I mentioned all that, um, that constantly gets ignored, which it very clearly states that the rule book is not a treatise on fencing. It's not it doesn't it's not about telling you how to fence. It's about the the written rule book is about trying to provide descriptions of what constitutes an attack but it doesn't define the only way to attack and i think if we were to go around limiting the creativity in our sport we have so many different nations with different styles and that's part of what makes fencing so interesting um, and we want to see athletes finding different ways to hit and different actions um, so it's important to remember especially as a referee that it's not your job to restrict the way fences can hit and can score it's your job simply to determine who began first um especially in, mod in modern foil there's a lot of um, flexibility given in um in terms of how athletes can launch their attacks they can commit a lot with the feet they can commit very little with the feet they can commit a lot with the hand or very little with the hands and that's part of what makes the game interesting um but yeah i'd say for referees you want to be want to have an open mind um and allow um, allow yourself um, have an open mind to what fences could be doing and what actions could work. Um, and I've I've spoken to some Grand Prix list, list referees who say at the um, at the highest level, they de the top level athletes definitely are pushing the boundaries of what you know what is acceptable, what can score and what can't score. 
And so you want to be very open open minded to um, to those actions. Well said. <laughs> Love the action. Unfortunately, this is not a very nice nice video for Maxime Pelty. That's the second time he's been called in preparation. Yeah, I, I, I um, apologize, and, Maxime. <laughs> <laughs> but um, another um, another lovely example, and also from a fencing point of view, that's that whole sequence was um, was wonderful. Seeing Al pushing Pelty back and forth in order to get him relaxed to the point where he would advance without quite committing. Um, just to show the um, the final action again, you can see Palti doesn't doesn't really isn't really watching when Avila begins. He's only thinking about his finish, um, and so Avila is able to start and have Palti reacting to him. Uh, to play it one more time, lovely action. And Karatsa going to Avila, I have a feeling it'll probably be Avila scoring a tap and prep again if this video is <laughs> anything to go, go against. Yeah, yeah this time um, this time Avila Quite manages to... Too. Yeah, and uh, Avila manages to bait Garozzo with the half step backwards. Um, but again, like there's there's his half step backwards. The timing of this one is actually very close, so I haven't quite been able to pause it um, before Garozzo be begins his attack. Um Yes, uh, uh, in fact, it was it was called uh, Garazzo's, but overturned on video. It's very close. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, um, yeah, it's very it's very close action. Um, this is this is certainly one I don't think you'd be able to cover up either the fencer and see. You, you're just looking for the context. You know Avila's action. He does a half step backwards and then a step lunge, and Garazzo rea reacts to him by trying to finish. Or if Garazzo had the attack, he would have begun first, predicting Avila's action. Um, so what you are looking for here is who begins first, and yeah, very. Um, that's this is a very high level call, um, very tough call. Um, but yeah, you can see Avila begins and Garozzo is reacting to him. Um, yeah, some really nice examples of attack and prep there, actually, James. All right. Well, in that case, let's switch over to the other half of this video, which is not attack and prep. Uh, this is just a couple of video examples of. Uh, attempted attack and prep, or that's what it looks like, which was not given. I actually think this scenario is slightly more common, um, not not scoring attack and prep because it is a um, it is a tough action to have, um, but it does it does keep an attacker honest. Um, so here we got Kasar against Sharapchenko. So here's Shorobchenko is looking for the um, looking for the attack and preparation, um, and if we um, there there probably is a window for it because, like we say, the um, the only part of Kasara's march where he is actually attacking is the final step lunge. So there are there is a window when he could begin an attack and preparation. In this case, Kasara advances though, and he very smoothly steps forward and finishes with his hand. But it's clear it's clearly a step lunge. He is um, he is launching attack. And Cherubchenko's attack and preparation could be said to be out of time. That is, it's. Um, this is a great example of what you said earlier about how uh, that would stop. It doesn't automatically mean Zerubchenko has priority. He yeah. had his chance. He did miss it though, and so it's Kasaris' touch, yeah. as you said before. Uh, and it's it's very common to see fences stop, and when they don't sense their opponents attacking they will start maybe not quite as ready which is what happens between Clyburn and Fakoni earlier um, and I suspect that's probably more the moment that Shobchenko was going for in this in this action it, expecting a preparation for, from Kasara but Kasara was quite switched on spotted the distance and yeah just finished with his hands This is a um, this is a pretty t pretty close one here. We um, we watched this we watched this one before. I um, I don't think it would have been outrageous to give this one to Ibadan, because I do think I do think Choi is being quite quite greedy in my opinion of uh, holding holding his hands. Um, I think one thing that hurts Ibadan's case is 
that he um, he does it only with a lunge. And if you look at the, the kind of lunge that Imboden is doing, it's a very um, it's a quite uncommitted lunge actually. He t- he lifts his foot quite early. He commits late within the lunge. It's kind of like a um, it's almost like a saber long lunge where they um, where they change line. Um, which gives him a lot of time to see where the choice is coming and then commits. And I do wonder whether the referee was saying, like, if Imboden has had committed with a fast lunge and Choi had been finishing after it, like he did here, I wonder whether it would have been more likely to give to him. Whereas it almost looks to me like Race is looking as he launched his lunge to see what Choi does. Um, whether mm, whether he, whether he, whether uh, he, he was for attack and prep, yeah, whether whether he was whether he was or not, I'm not. Um, like I can say it's certainly hard to, hard to do at that speed. But for example, um, in terms of fencing, perhaps it was possible that he would begin to start his start his foot and then turn it into a counter attack, or begin to start his foot, take a counter time, um, or some some other actions. So perhaps perhaps the referees looking at slow mo here said that Choi actually actually committed to the final action first. For me, this is a very, very tight action. I think it could have been given to Imboden. But those are two of the best referees in the world on um, on there, both video and refereeing that bout. So in my, in my opinion, the definition of top-level foil actions are what the best referees in the world will call. So if they say that that action is attack for Choi, then I'd say it's attack for Choi. usual suspects indeed Itkin and Garozzo yeah so Garozzo is very care- very careful here to begin his attack you can you can see when he when, as it can as it can breaks distance a little bit Garozzo Garozzo knows that because it's Itkin that he's gonna break distance and then do a step lunge looking for looking for preparation so rather than simply passively advancing if you watch Garozzo as it can breaks distance he advances in and finishes with his hands yeah, being very careful, and this is this is probably the most common common response to as looking for attack and prep when they open the distance, trying to find the room to to begin their attack first. You'll see the advancing fencer close in and continue. Yes, the speed up a little bit just to to start that. Yeah. Oh, and this is a this is quite a wonderful example actually of what I was saying about the attack stop. So Fitzgerald um, stops. And Grotso is looking to take over on that stop, but he's a little bit late because Fitzgerald, rather unusually, actually, most people won't do this, um, immediately begins again. So we have Fitzgerald moves in and stops and then restarts. And you can see how long Grotso takes to begin his attack into it. Um, yeah, and just a bit on the late side of Grotso. I think we saw that one in another mm-hmm. video, in your refereeing video. Yep. That is correct. Yeah, yeah, I thought I remember the action. Yeah, interesting action. Um, okay, here we have Yavador against Safin. You do see a lot of the same fencers. Lavador, uh, top level eight, the same people. Sorry? Lavador may be a little late there. I'm just speculating. Yeah, a, li- a little bit. A little bit on the late side. Again, there's. Um, there's a moment where Staffin accelerates and slows down, um, which is a clear indicator. Like at this point, point we're just after it. Staffin has accelerated; he's slowed down again, and that that's a clear indicator to Yavador he's not attacking right now. But Staffin Staffin just doesn't accelerate, stop, and then start again. He smoothly transitions into his next motion, and you can see he he transitions straight into advancing his hand towards the target. Yes. Um, perhaps parallels could be drawn between this and the uh, Avila Safin. Yes, yes, call almost definitely. Yeah, yes, definitely. It's almost the um, same, but not quite. Safin just. Yeah. And this is this is probably the textbook example of how to um, how to do to bait someone into thinking you stopped. Um, but it's, it's definitely hard to get wrong. I think a lot of people aren't quite aware of what their um, what their fencing looks like from the side. And it'll be very easy to get this one not quite right to maybe hold back a little bit too much after the change in and change in foot speed. Um, but Safin handles it very nicely here. Yeah. 
Ah, yes. So I'm I'm quite surprised by this call. Um, I um, I thought this would be given to Ho, in my opinion. Um, this was from 2018 Wushu. Yeah, Carl seems to be holding back, back from me, waiting a long time, and he only commits after after Shin Ho begins his his action. Um, I, I wasn't the referee on the ground. Um, I only have to do for me. Um, and it's always possible to disagree, especially on actions. Um, in my in my opinion, I would have given this this action to the Korean. Uh, but maybe people watching the video will tell me I'm wrong on this one. It's always it's always possible to be wrong. Fair enough. And this is why, um, as a fencer, you should not rely on attacking prep too heavily. Of course, I think I think it's a key um, it's a key part of the fencing toolkit. I definitely um, I'm definitely sad when I see the number of referees who simply do not call the action, and therefore the number of fencers, uh, especially below um, below a certain level, who do not have it as part of their toolkit. Because I, I think it is an important part of fencing. I think the prevalence of marching attacks, um, especially at intermediate level, is heavily related to the not non-calling of attack and preparation because it's the natural it's the natural answer to that action, to a, a marching mm -hmm. attack where you do not commit until you have seen what your opponent does. The answer is they should go first. Um, so I do think it's an important part of the toolkit. But yes, like like any um, like any fencer in any competition, the objective isn't to be to be right, the objective is to win. So you have to work with what your referee is calling. And if you determine that your referee maybe is a bit sir, allowing allowing a little little more leniency for the attack, or maybe they're very tight and they got a lot of tang and breath, then as a fencer, it's important to be able to react to that and to use it to your advantage. Very wise words. <laughs> Well, this, uh, uh, there's the occasional disagreement between FIE refs, as you can see here. Although, as Chris said, this is just a video; he wasn't actually oh, there. Yeah, of course. And um, and part of what makes the game interesting is changes in convention. There, um, the um, the room for what is considered an attack and prep, uh, the, the leniency for the march is definitely less now than it was, for example, in 2016. There's been a trend in the last four years. Uh, moving oh, to yeah, make the game a little clip from two years ago. Yeah, making um, yeah, making the game a little bit tighter. So maybe at the time that call was more accurate to convention. Um, I definitely think right now, in my opinion, um, the state of refereeing is probably the most consistent I have seen it. Um, I think among FIE referees, there's always some var some variation, particularly between um. For example, Ita um, like Italian and Russian referees will tend to be a bit more loose on the feet and more a little more loose with the attack, um, whereas American French referees tend to be a bit tighter, a bit more fo um, a little more focused on the hand and also a bit more focusing on the attack and preparation. But I think generally, while I haven't, I think the refereeing is very consistent. I think the game is in a very good state, actually. Um, I think that's probably heavily due to the availability of so much so much video. Um where where Chris referees coming out here with the good news. <laughs> I'm sure people will disagree with me and tell me how every referee is inconsistent and wrong, but yeah, that's my that's my opinion. Um yeah, we have a uh, uh CS and Chris Mepsters. And this is another very, very nice example from Michael Ciesa of, um, of dealing with the attack on preparation. Uh, he cha changes the tempo and then just continues and finishes. Um, and Marcus just over Marcus overcooks it a little bit in how much room he takes. Uh, you can see even uh, Michael Ciesa here taking, a, um, taking that large step. And Marcus, after it, continues back for quite a bit. Um, for anyone who referees into Sabre, this action is very similar in concept to the reprise attack call, which is quite important in Sabre right now, which will, if a Sabre takes too much room backwards instead of capitalising on the full short. And you mentioned that big step. I know this is an attack of prep 
video, but uh, what's what's the point at which you call attack now? Um, if they if they attack, <laughs> okay. Um, but of course, yeah. There's um, that's not that's not in the realm of attack. No, is it? Well, even um, even if you wanted to call this um, call this attack attack no. So if you were to say he tries to attack now, I don't think he does for me. Um, I think you could say now, like at this moment here, you could reasonably say, okay, I get, you'll give a tempo, allow allow the opposing center if they want to immediately take over on their attack. No, but I'm pretty sure Marcus takes another step back here, and then he begins afterwards. Uh, so, so even if it was, it, it's still repeats from the left. Well, I think uh, I think if CS actually committed to an an attack there, he wouldn't be able to so easily then continue straight into his next action. Um, we're, talk we're talking uh, well, theoretical here, of course. Of a, um, we're talking theoretically of an action that didn't actually happen, of course. But yeah, I think I think if he actually committed to a lunge here, he wouldn't be he wouldn't be able to immediately bring his back foot up again and continue with his march. Um, so yeah, no, I, I wouldn't see that. Of course, it is. It is a large step like that is a very clear indicator of the moment they're not attacking. Because if they don't, if they don't attack on a big step like that, then they're clearly preparing. So if Marcus, in response to that last step, immediately took over with his own attack, would have been a very clear attack and preparation moment. Ah, okay. Thanks for uh, discussing that. Yeah, no, no worries, no worries. Of course, these are these are my own ways of uh, of trying to uh, to rationalize these into a way that's uh, helpful to understand and i've heard um, i think it's like like any um like any concept uh, that anyone learns uh, people learn in different ways and i've heard uh, different mnemonics i've heard um, i've heard different explanations which help people understand and i think it's a I think it's important to understand that referees are usually trying to get across the same concepts in different ways in order to facilitate that understanding. Ooh. That was ambitious by Sheravchenko, in my opinion. Um, so we've, oh, okay, yeah, these are two calls from the same match. I was just checking we hadn't gone backwards. Um, yeah, so I think Sheremchenko thought that Gorotso would continue to advance passively there, um, but actually he finishes with his arm. I think at this moment Sheremchenko thought that Gorotso was going to stop. If you look at Gorotso's feet, it's very tempting to see that think think that he will stop, but actually what he does is he continues into a lunge, finishing on the back. Um, mm. Very nice action. Very nice action by Gorotso. Excellent timing. Yes, indeed. And we have another one from the same match. Yes, uh, Zerbchenko called video on this. The ref came back and indicated that uh, the timing was good, but it looked like a counter-attack to him, uh, physically. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so Garotso is advancing. Gets caught on his feet. Oh, oh, that's how it's back to the start. You can see, you can see here. This is a nice example of what we were speaking at earlier. I'll slow down so people can see the blades, um, but the blade isn't particularly important here for the actual action. Um, but you can see uh, uh, Karotso is going for Sheravchenko's blades, going for a cease take. I actually haven't managed to slow it down. It seems. Um, there we go. Um, Grosso goes for Shevchenko's blade and Shevchenko's atta attacking into that moment. I can I can very much see where Shevchenko is coming from from here. Um, I think the referee is saying that the way the way Shevchenko withdraws from the action, finishing with his arm, um, fin finishing with his arm covering his um, covering his uh, his flank. Um, Almost like, and also retracting backwards. Looks like he's trying to prevent Garotto from hitting him. Um, Especially since Garotto is trying to hit. It seems like on the back. Or yeah, he, the, hits, the, he hits him on the area. back near, near the shoulder blade. Um, so yeah, I think um, I would. 
I don't mind either call, to be honest. I think it's per- I think it's fine to say. Um, I think it's fine to say that Garozzo finished the action and completed it. I think. I think Shevchenko found a good moment there. I think it would have been good to give that action to Shevchenko. But I don't know the context of the bout and also what the referee has been calling throughout the bout and how tight the actions have been, essentially. Um, the, you said the referee came back and said, uh, d- you could hear him say it, did you, that it, it was a counterattack uh, at the right no, timing? No, but he acted it out. Oh, OK. For so, Shevchenko. So he said he... Well, he, he spoke to him. He found he found he found the correct moment for attack and preparation, but the action itself was too much like a counter attack. Mm-hmm. Like uh, interesting kind of twist with the arm and such. I think uh, this is referring to what we were talking about at the very start of the year about how it finished the actions. I certainly um I certainly knew um I've known fences. I used to be guilty of this. Um, who would um react to scoring a hit by immediately turning around and celebrating. And it had a tendency to look like they were spinning out into a counter attack. So their attacks, um, their attacks preparation might look at, like counters. I don't think Shobchenko, in my opinion, was going for counter attack there. So if the referee, um, if the referee feels that the timing was attack and preparation, I think it, the timing was was for attack and preparation. The referee is simply saying that it wasn't an attack; it was a counter attack on preparation, which is irrelevant. Um, so. If that's the if that's the case, in my opinion, I might feel that was actually Shevchenko's action. But again, we um, our video creates interesting artifacts. It's amazing that how differently something can look when you're seeing it live. It's also amazing sometimes how differently even a different camera angle can make an action look. Sometimes when you're watching World Cups and you see the different the different camera angles, you can um, oh, yes. you can get a totally different impression of the actions. Um, the very fact that we can see the referee means that uh, we are not looking at it from the same angle as he is. Exactly, we have a slightly different view. We are, we can't really see the um, the point or the hands. Like it's very difficult on video to see um, how fences, for example, are turning their hands, what um, what angles of hits they're going for, stuff like this. Um, so always put my trust in the referee on the grounds, really. But, um, but yeah, I think this action certainly, I think Shobchenko had a strong argument for attacking prep. Interesting action. All right. Uh, thank you for coming on and discussing attack and prep. Hopefully this uh, video can encourage some discussion and uh, learning about this topic. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, I, like, um, I think I think it's a misunderstood action. I hope that that random ramble of, um, of different... Um, watching different hits and saying different random things. I hope that's um, that's somewhat helpful. I think more, more than anything, um, I mean, the, the FIE database of referees is public, so it's very it's very easy to go and find out who your country's FIE referees are, who are actively refereeing, ref, refereeing internationally. And, um, and if not, there's lots of top fences coaches, referees around who are, um, who are very current on these things. And I, I think it never hurts to ask. I think the uh, the culture of silence around um, around fencing is not a very not a very healthy one. I think it's always good if um, if people are talking and discussing actions, trying to understand our sport better. Okay, very well said. Thank you for coming <laughs> on, Chris. No worries. Thank, thank you very much for having me, James.